hello, good evening, or good day, depending on where in the world that you are. Uh, so um, I can see that there are still a few people that are trying to connect. So I will wait a little bit with their presentation. But in the meanwhile, I will present myself. So my name is Solly. And uh, this evening we will be talking about how you can tether in uh, food photography. And we will also be talking about um, monitors for photographers, color management. And then I'll also be taking you behind the scenes, showing you how I tether and um, also how I edit photos in Lightroom. Uh, I would also like to thank our hosts the, of the webinar, Park Cameras, Tether Tools, BenQ and XRite. And um, I think we could, well, I see that most of the people are connected now. In any case, this webinar is going to be uh, recorded, so you will all receive a link in the end. So I'll just remove my web camera. There we go. And I hope that you all can see my presentation. Let's see. Okay, perfect. Perfect. So to give you an overview of what I will cover this evening, I have put together an agenda that we can have a look now before I begin. So first I will be going through color management. As you all know, color is very important in food photography. So I will share some um, tools that I use to get the colors right. Having a good monitor is, uh, that is adapted for photographers can make a huge impact when editing images. Let's see if you can, okay, so now you can see the arrow uh, when you edit images. And this is something that we will discuss later this evening as well. And I will also explain why it's important to calibrate uh, your monitor on a regular basis. And then I will be introducing you to the universe of tethering, what it is, what equipment you would need and its benefits. Then I will be taking you behind the scenes. I will show you how I tether and I will also show how I prepare a food scene. And then in the end, I will be editing a photo live in Lightroom so you can see how the post processing is. And I think all this will take around, let's say, 40 to 45 minutes. And then we will be having a Q&A in the end. And as I mentioned earlier, this webinar is recorded, so you will all receive a link uh, to the replay in one or two days. Before beginning with a presentation, I would like to introduce myself to those of you who don't know me. So my name is Solly Canani. I'm from Sweden, but I'm based here in Paris, in France since almost a little bit more than 10 years now. That said, I'm not a native English speaker, so if there is any awkward pause, don't worry. Just means that I'm trying to find the correct word in English. So today I work both with brands, restaurants and hotels, capturing plates of Michelin starred and award winning chefs. And I was also shortlisted in um, the prestigious Pink Lady Food Photographer of the Year 2020 with these four photos. And uh, I was also a finalist in the Chefs World Summit Food Photography competition last year. And I'm also a Nikon partner and an x uh, Photo Colorado and a BenQ AQ Color expert, um, expert. You can follow me on Instagram. I have two uh, accounts, one for uh, landscape photography and one that is dedicated for food photography. And uh, last year, I created a YouTube channel devoted for food photography. 
And there you can actually find a few tutorials and there will be new episodes coming out very soon too. And you can find the link here. So it's the link tree link, or you can also go to my um, food Instagram account and there you can click on the link that is in the profile. And I'll just be showing you a part of my portfolio so you have an idea of what kind of photos I shoot. So as you can see, I love doing these dark and moody photos like these and um, also macro shots, close up shots on fruits and vegetables. But of course, I also do bright and high key photos. So it's a mix of everything. So let's move on. So in food photography, colors plays an important role. As we can't touch, feel, nor smell the food, we have to create an interest by visually showing something that can evoke an appetite in the eyes of the viewer. And that is why it's crucial to get the colors right. In the beginning, I often struggle with white balance. My photos were often either too cold, like this one, or too warm, like this one. I had a hard time getting the white balance correct. So here is the milk in the bottle. But just because the subject that you are photographing is white doesn't mean that it will remain white in your image. So it can have either a warm tint or a colder tint, like these two images. And that is why white balance is important. So a light source can be described either as cold or warm or neutral. And these graduations are defined as uh, color temperature and is measured in Kelvin. So in this color temperature chart, you can see that the warmer uh, or more yellow the light is, it has a lower degree of Kelvin. And the cooler uh, or more blue the light is, it has a higher degree of Kelvin. So that means that the color temperature of the light affects what our camera is capturing. So even though our eyes will see an object as white, like the milk in the bottle, our camera is not as intelligent and can't adjust automatically to different color temperatures like our eyes can do. So sometimes you would get more co cooler images like this one, or images that has a more warmer tint. There are different ways of correcting white balance. You can either set the white balance manually by um, in your directly in your camera by taking a close-up photo of a 18% uh, gray card. You can also use a color temperature meter or a color chart. Personally, I prefer using a color chart as it has more um, reference points and provide more precise colors like you can see here. So this is the um, color chart from x -Rite. It's called Color Checker Passport Photo that I'm using. and um, I find it very easy to use as it saves me lots of time in the post-processing and uh, I don't need to adjust the color temperature and white balance manually in Lightroom. I will quickly show you how I use the card uh, and what result that you can achieve with it. So you have to make sure that you're shooting in RAW, so that's very important. And then you have to place the color checker uh, you have to place the color checker next to your subject, like here. And the size of the color checker should take at least up to 10% of the frame in an image that is 10 megapixels. So at least 10% of the frame. And the passport should be in parallel with your subject and uh, your lens. And you have to make sure that it's not tilted. Uh, to create the color profile as accurate as possible, it's important that the passport is in focus, so these colors should not be blurry. And uh, you have to make sure that the uh, passport 
also is perfectly exposed. So the image should not be too dark or too bright. So when you are done with your shooting, you simply create a customized camera profile in your post-processing software, and that doesn't take more than a few seconds. Here you can see an example of the result. So uh, in the image to the left is the before image, and this is the after image. So it's the same image, but here I'm using the customized camera profile, and this is the before image. So you can see that it has a warmer tint. It's actually a little bit uh, pink, but with the um, color passport, you can easily fix that. And uh, in my YouTube channel, I have a dedicated episode on white balance and also how I use a color checker if you want to see more of this. Let's move on to monitors. If you print your photos or simply publish them um, online, then a monitor for photographers is very useful. So before I was editing using this screen of my iMac, I had an iMac before and the MacBook Pro. But then I discovered that there are monitors for photographers. So today I'm using this monitor from BenQ, SW321C, with a 32 inch panel which is a very powerful monitor that I recommend. In fact, BenQ, they have a whole series of monitors for photographers in different sizes. And uh, the most uh, important features that all these monitors have are that they are, they measure 24 inches and some of them are bigger like this one, 32 inch. And they all have a 4K resolution and 4K resolution provides exceptional accuracy of details and texture. And that's perfect for people like me who loves macro shots. So here I can really dive deep in the images to make sure that everything is sharp. Uh, their monitors also cover 100% of the sRGB color space. And the sRGB color space is used when you publish images online. And these monitors also cover 99% of the uh, Adobe RGB space. And this space is used when uh, you are preparing images for print. And thanks to these color spaces, uh, you'll have the pleasure to see more realistic colors, rep color representation from your photos. Uh, last but not least, the IPS panel. The, so the monitors from BenQ, they also have an IPS panel and IPS stands for in-plane switching. So depending on what angle you're viewing your monitor, so either from the left side or the right side, unless you're sitting just in front of your monitor, the saturation and contrast in the image or in the screen will remain. So this means that the adjustments made to the photo will look the same no matter what angle you're looking on the image from. So uh, if you have a look on the same image on your monitor and your laptop, you will most likely notice some differences in terms of color unless you calibrate. And for this reason, we need to make sure that the device we are using, in this case, the monitor, to um, do the post-production and the vis uh, visualization, which is the MacBook, it's very important that they are correctly calibrated. And this is where the color meter sensor becomes relevant. So using by using a software, I like here, and a hardware. This is the hardware, a color meter sensor, and they're also called a probe. You can create an ICC pro, uh, profile, and that will let your monitor display colors correctly. Uh, I'm using this x uh, i1 display pro that you can see here. And uh, the workflow to calibrate is very simple. You simply turn on your monitor and the software, and then you put the probe here, and you can see the cable. 
so it's hanging down and then you have to do some settings and then the software will be start showing different colors that this probe will read and after almost uh, I think 10 or 15 minutes you'll have an ICC pro uh, profile created letting your monitor let's go back uh, le letting your monitor uh, display colors correct and this is something that you have to do on a regular basis I would say at least once a month because um, to keep your monitor happy and healthy. Tethering. I don't know how many of you that are familiar with tethering, but for those of you who are not, I will explain what it is. And it's very simple. It's actually when you uh, connect your camera to your laptop, as you can see here. And that way you can actually see in the monitor of your laptop what your camera can see so directly here on the screen of your laptop so just look here in this picture the live view screen of the camera is very small especially compared to uh, your laptop and if you want to have even a bigger visibility than your laptop you can actually um, connect your laptop to a monitor and uh, but why would we like to see things bigger than the live view screen well there are many reasons especially in food photography because the details are very important especially the texture of food and we also need to make sure that everything is sharp and in focus and verifying all those things in a small live view screen of uh, your camera is quite difficult and time consuming because you have to actually manually uh, zoom in on different parts of the image each time. I don't know about you, but for me it happened many times before that I spent hours preparing a food scene and then when I had removed everything from the scene and uh, was uh, importing the photos, I noticed that some details that I wish I had seen before to change. So it could be, for example, uh, repositioning um, different subjects in the scene, remove or replace them. Uh, in the live view, it's really difficult to see those things. And moreover, if you're shooting for a client, then there should not even be a doubt whether to tether or not. Not only because you really need to make sure that your images are sharp, the composition is right, and the, the uh, details in the scenes are perfect, but often the client also wants to see the photos and monitor the work and it's more professional letting them view the images on a bigger screen than the live view of your camera and they can actually do this even remotely if you share your screen with them uh, tethering also lets you control your camera and that is especially useful for when you do uh, flat lays like here, here I have um, attached my camera to a light stand. So I'm taking an overhead image and um, I can see the uh, live view here on my laptop. So here I don't need to uh, climb up on the table or the chair and bend over the camera to see that everything is perfect. So this is very useful in this case as well. And uh, all you need to tether is a USB cable. And before buying a USB cable, you have to pay attention that the USB port uh, to the USB port of your laptop and your camera. And um, this is a USB cable from uh, Tether Tools, and they come in different lengths. I got the longest one, I think. I think it's uh, 4.6 meter and uh, I find it perfect, especially since I often do um, flat lays like here. So I would, I really need a cable that is pretty long because sometimes I have my uh, 
laptops further further away. Uh, there is also uh, let's see, there is also another tool that is handy when tethering, and that is the jerk stopper. And uh, this one is also from Tether Tools because accidents can happen. For example, if you would step on the uh, cable here, because you would probably go back and forth between your, uh, between your laptop and the food scene, and if you would uh, step on the ca cable, then you might, and the, if the cable would be dragged out from your camera, then you might um, damage the USB port of your camera. So to avoid unexpected accidents, a jerk stopper is um, uh, great as it ensures that the cable stays safe in uh, the USB port. And there is one for the camera that you can see here. It's attached to the camera, so as soon as you have inserted uh, the cable to your camera, you simply attach it to the camera. And it's the same here. I have attached it to the laptop stand after inserting the cable to the laptop. Um, earlier, I mentioned the uh, benefits of tethering, and there is one more thing I would like to add to that list, and that is that you can have your images imported straight to your computer and Lightroom, if that's the software that you're working with. This will let you save even more time, as you don't need to remove the memory card of your camera and import the images manually. And uh, in my YouTube channel, there is a dedicated episode where I show how you can do that. But in short, you create a folder, a temporary folder on your laptop, and then Lightroom uh, grabs the images, and then you have them all in the catalog. So let's see. So now, uh, enough with theory. I will start playing a video where you will see how I connect my camera to my laptop, and you'll also see how I arrange a scene creating these two images. So hang on, I'll just find the video. Uh, let's see, uh, it's here. I'll put it on widescreen and on full screen and here we go. Hey guys, so now we are behind the scenes and I'll be showing you how I'm shooting tethered. But first I'll just quickly explain how I have set up everything. So here is the flash, here is the table where I will be preparing the food scene. Here is my camera that I have attached to a C-stand and this is my laptop and this is the USB-C cable from Tether Tools and I'll be using this to connect my camera to my laptop. Depending on your camera, there are different USB cables. I have a USB-C port, so I'm using the USB-C cable from Tether Tools. So here I've inserted the cable to my camera and I have already attached the jerk stopper. So once the USB cable is in my camera, I simply attach the jerk stopper to keep it in place. I also have a USB-C port on my laptop and here I am inserting the other end of my cable and then I fix it with a jerk stopper that I have already attached to my laptop stand to keep the cable fixed. So now my camera is connected to my laptop and I've just started the software smart shooter. For this shooting, I have decided that the images I want to create should have a dark and moody feeling. So I have chosen a backdrop that is dark and also plates and bowls in a dark color. These are almost black or at least very, very dark gray. If you notice, you will see that they are all matte, 
When using ceramic with a glaze, they often reflect the light and I want to avoid reflections as much as possible in my photos. So I always try to buy matte tableware. I usually make a list and note down everything I have imagined to have in the scene. And I also often make a draft with sketches as suggestions on compositions. It's always good to do the creative brainstorming before and plan ahead as much as possible. But it doesn't mean you can't improvise while shooting. A flat lay doesn't need to be flat. It's flattering for the eye to create depth by adding layers. And that can be done by, for example, using bowls and plates in different sizes and heights, etc. Just to explain how it looks around the scene here that you can't see in this live view, I have a strobe on the left side or the softbox and I'm using a C-stand that you could see earlier in the clip with a camera attached just above the scene. Once I have set the plates how I want to have them and taken some test photos to make sure the light is okay, I add the waffles. To add some life and a more realistic feeling to the image so it won't look too staged, I like to take some of the toppings that I have used and put them here and there in the scene. It should look a bit messy but not too much. The whipped cream is something I add in the very very end. I'm using real whipped cream here but I know some photographers use shaving foam. But I haven't found the one that looks fluffy as whipped cream, so I'm using the real thing here. This also means that the whipped cream loses its fluffiness after a while. In the sidebar to the left, you can see that you have all the camera settings, so you can control your camera from the software, and you can also drag the focus point and see where you want to have it in the scene. So here I feel the scene is ready. And I put the focus point on the waffle, the hero waffle in this image. And as soon as I have pressed the shutter, the image will be imported straight to Lightroom. Here I have a quick check to see if everything is okay in terms of light and sharpness. You can see in the histogram it's a bit underexposed, but it's dark and a moody image. So that's perfectly fine. Now I'm moving on with a second shot. It's an angle shot around 45 degrees. The plan here is to dust icing sugar on top of the stack that I have built with the waffles. The reason why I don't want to do a straight on shot is that I want the viewer to see more of the waffle that is on the top and also the topping. And we wouldn't see much of it with a straight on shot. You can't see it here, but to the left of the scene I have my strobe with a softbox and the camera I have attached to a tripod that is just in front of the scene. As I will be standing next to the table dusting the sugar on top, I will need to shoot on remote. In Smart Shooter you have a function called Time Lapse. There you can set how many images you want to have taken and with what interval. If you have a look on the left sidebar, you simply go to settings, choose time lapse, and there you choose the number of photos you want to have taken. To make sure the dusting sugar will be in focus as well as the waffles, it's important you set the focus point in the right position and shoot in manual, and then make sure to dust the sugar in that spot. Here you can see that I drag the green focus point box to just between the raspberry and strawberry. Once everything is set, I click on run on the right sidebar and go to the table and start dusting the sugar and the images are automatically imported to Lightroom. There I have a quick look on all of them to make sure that at least I got some images that I can use. Okay guys, I'm back and um, as, let's see if I'm just going to try to find the correct slide. Uh, here we are and I'm just going to 
minimize the window. Perfect. So uh, let's have a look on this image. So um, as uh, a shooting can take hours, and um, I only showed you a short part of it, but I hope that you found it useful. As I mentioned in the video, planning is important. And uh, I actually made uh, two sketches for these images. Let's see if I can show you uh, them. So I made a sketch for the flat lay and for the um, for the angle view. Uh, and um, in the first webinar that I had last year, I'm going through compositions. And I think that we can put a link to that webinar when this webinar is uploaded. So you can have a look on that one. And uh, because, and then I also have an episode on my YouTube that is dedicated to compositions, if you want to see different composition styles. But I will just explain what kind of um, composition that I used here that I didn't mention in the video. And that is the uh, golden triangle. So uh, the golden triangle is when you draw a line from one of the corners, so it could be this or actually any of the corners. So this one to the opposite one. So let's say here, and then you draw another line to the diagonal and creating um, 90 degrees here. And that's where you should put your hero. So my hero subject in this image is uh, this waffle. So the image looks, I mean, our eyes will be attracted directly or drawn directly to this one. And um, it's more eye pleasing than if I had put this plate here in the corner or here or here or anywhere outside this um, the line. So that's the composition that I used. And um, what else that I can mention on these? Um, yeah, so I do always I do the sketches because um, and I also try to plan the composition before. And uh, that saves me a lot of time because when I'm shooting, I have so many other things to focus on. The light, for example, and all the technical parts. So if I have one sketch or several sketches ready, it's easy for me to create the scene that I had in mind. And I will not forget about any details. So that's something that I really recommend you to do. And um, what else here? I don't think I mentioned it before, but it's also nice in a flat lay to um, add some movement. And here I did that by positioning the waffles in this way. So you can see they are moving to the left. And here you can see that there is a curve. And um, these small jocks are directed to uh, the left and I put the forks not straight, but they are <clears throat> directed uh, straight up and a little bit to the left. And all that is to um, create some movement in the, um, the flat lay. So we have some more life. And um, yeah, I also like to add some of the topping uh, on the table in the scene, not too much, but at least a few to make it a bit, to look, to make it look a bit more realistic. Uh, okay, so I think we will move on to, let's see, these two pictures. So these are the two pictures that I uh, got from the shooting. And uh, we will have a poll because now I will be editing these. So these two are already edited, but I will uh, reset them in Lightroom and I will be editing one of them. So we will have a poll and you will decide which one of these photos that I will edit. And uh, you'll have one minute to decide and then I will share my Lightroom with you.
Okay, I can see that nearly almost everybody have voted now. So let's see if I can get the results. Okay, so photo number two, great choice. So that's this is the photo that I will be editing. Uh, okay, let's see. I will just turn. Oh, let's see. Now I will just share the Lightroom. Mm -hmm. Here we go. So now you, I hope that you can see my screen and we'll enter full screen there we go and i'll just move this window so i can see everything perfect okay okay so this is number no this is the picture that we will edit so this is the before i will just reset the image Okay, perfect. So, um, <clears throat> sorry guys, I just need to drink a little bit more water. Okay, so in Lightroom, I have already prepared and I have created a color profile uh, thanks to the um, X-Ride Color Checker Passport that I mentioned before. So that's the first thing that I will do here. I will be looking for the color profile and uh, I do, I just need to go to browse and I named it waffle. So it should be somewhere here, I hope. Let's see if we can find it. There it is. So that's the camera profile that I uh, created. And now it's time to add my uh, artistic style. So the first th thing that I do is to look on my image and find things that I don't like. And uh, there are a few things. I can see that the whipped cream here is uh, overexposed. So that's something that I need to fix. And um, then, the berries here, the blueberries are a bit dark. So are the um, raspberries. So that's something that I need to um, fix. And uh, I think the um, dusting sugar here is also a bit overexposed. So I'll fix that too. So in the beginning, it's always good to see what you want to fix and then start with the challenge so uh, the first thing that i do is that i go down here in the sidebar panel and um, you have to make sure that the checkbox for remove chromatic aberration is checked and that you also check the box for enable profile correction and why do we do this because when you enable lens profile con uh, correction, then Lightroom uh, will make adjustments and uh, correct any distortion or vignetting that has been created by your particular lens. So you have to look for your lens as well. So I was using a Nikon and the model it already found it. It was the 50 millimeter. So now we are good to go. And uh, then I go up. And what I do later is to make sure that it's straight. But I think, yes, it's perfectly straight. So there is nothing to do on that part. Then I, <clears throat> even though I have um, the correct uh, white balance, I do like to add my artistic touch. So I actually like, would prefer to have this image a little bit colder. So like this. So I drag, so I'm here at the temperature bar and I drag it slightly to the left side, making the image a bit colder. <clears throat> and uh, then I, um, let's see, then I go to, uh, exposure 
and you can see that it's um, underexposed and that's perfectly fine because here I was trying to achieve, have a um, dark and moody image so those are always underexposed and I don't think I will change I think I will even decrease the um, exposure a little bit and then add a bit of contrast then I go down to uh, highlights so I want to add some more highlights to the whipped cream so I do a generic um, modification here for the entire image and then I will target the whipped cream <clears throat> later and for the shadows I think I will just let's see open up the shadows slightly and the whites I will decrease it slightly and the blacks I usually decrease a very little bit and then we are here at the <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just going to drink a little bit more water. Okay, um, <clears throat> now we are at the uh, texture and uh, clarity. It's good not to go um, all in with these two settings because um, it can be too much in the image. So be very careful. The difference between clarity and uh, texture is that the texture, <clears throat> the texture slider, is um, it's mu is much less harsh than uh, clarity. So you can see here, if I drag clarity up to yeah, 60, it's very rough and harsh. And if you compare it to the texture, you see that it um takes the midtones of an image and enhances them so it's it adds some sharpness to a photo and increase the texture as well but not as the clarity so here i just increase the texture a little bit because we do want to have uh, some more texture of the berries and the clarity i will increase a little bit as well and then the vibrance I increase slightly because it's nice to have the colors of the berries to pop out in this um, <clears throat> in this image <clears throat> in this dark and moody image. And then we go to the tone curve here. I like to decrease the dark slightly and open up the shadows a little bit. And uh, then I also do some color adjustments. For example, here we have, I don't like the yellow tint we have on the waffles. I want to make them more orange. So that's something that we can change here. And you can drag, increase the saturation a little bit and add some more luminance. And I think, I would also <clears throat> decrease the saturation a little bit and increase the luminance a little bit and the yellow I like to decrease slightly and then we go to the red color for the raspberries I like to add them to pop out so I increase the saturation uh, not too much, but like this, I think it's perfect. And the luminance as well, and the hue like this, and the blue for the um, <clears throat> for the blueberries. I think I'll increase the saturation and the luminance. I'm increasing a little bit as well, and the hue. I don't. Let's see, you can make sure that you can see the difference here. So here you can see that I'm, you can see a small difference. So I'm here, I'm increasing the blue color a little bit. Okay, so these are the things that I do first in an image. And now we're going to target the, um, the whipped cream. <clears throat> And that is something that I can do with 
using the uh, <clears throat> the brush, the adjustment brush. So I click on the adjustment brush and then I click here and I will just make the image a little bit bigger so we can have a better visibility of on the whipped cream. So here we are. And then I also click on O on my laptop, on my keyboard. So here I will be able to see uh, the selected areas. So what I will do is that I will simply brush over the area that is overexposed, which I think was this part. And then when I click on O again, it will be removed and then I can adjust the highlight. So for example, if I increase it, it will be too overexposed. So you have to be very careful. So here I am um, decreasing the highlights very, very slightly, just so we can see the, um, the texture of the whipped cream. And uh, what I will do is to adjust the shadows as well to bring them out. I decrease the shadows and uh, I think that's it. I increase the whites a little bit, but I think that's perfectly fine. And uh, just to show you the before and after on the whipped cream. So this is the before. I will just enlarge the image a little bit more here. So this is the before and this is the after. So it's a very, very small difference, but it makes a more impact, a better impact on the overall image. And I think we will do the same here. I will add another brush here and show the selected overlay and I will create a bigger brush. And then I think it was only this part then that I um, uh, brushed over. And then I will make a few adjustments here as well. So the highlights I will... Okay, so this was not reset. I will... I think I need to... Yes, let's see what I did now. I have to create a new, let's see. I'm just going to enlarge this because I made a modification. Let's see if it was the highlights. No, here, perfect. Okay, so done, you click on done when you're done. And then I want to add a new brush and correct the glazing sugar so here I'm just brushing over the part or the area that is overexposed and then I click on O again to remove the highlighted area and then I will so this should be set to zero I'm just going to fix that just give me a second like this and then I'll add it again Okay, so let's see here and I'll remove that and here I'll just decrease the shadows a little bit and decrease the highlights slightly. And I also want, want to add some extra texture and uh, clarity like this and then I'm done. Let's see, so now I have fixed the whipped cream that was underexposed and the uh, powdered sugar as well. And now I want to um, adjust the, uh, the raspberries that I find to be a bit too dark and I will use the brush again. So this is not set to zero. Let's see, I'll just do that now. Done. Okay, and now it should be fine. Perfect. So I'll begin with the, um, <clears throat> let's say the raspberries. So here it's, we have a pretty dark part. I'll make 
a smaller brush. So here you can actually, I didn't mention it before, but you can actually um, change the size of your brush. So here, since the raspberries are small, I want a smaller brush. So I click here and then I'm just going to brush over the part that is in shadow and that I want to have open up the shadows. So I'm uh, brushing these raspberries, let's see. And then I will open up the shadows a little bit like this and the highlights a little bit and yeah not so much but a little bit i'm increasing the exposure as well but just very very slightly and then i want to add some extra texture and clarity let's have a look and see on the before and after so you can see it's a slight difference um let's see if i minimize the image so you can see the overall difference so here is so now you can see that they are popping out a little bit more. Mm, now I'm done with the raspberries and um, I will start to brush the blueberries. So I'm, I clicked on the brush, created a new brush. And now I will simply brush the blueberries that are in the shadow like this. And maybe this too. So it's important that you don't brush on the um, the part of the berries that are already that has a good exposure so only on the part that is under exposed like that and then i will open up the shadows and increase the uh, highlights and maybe add a little bit more exposure and add some more texture and clarity to those berries and I think I'm done there. So that's, uh, let's see what else. I think I will also do something with a strawberry. I'm using the brush again, and I'm just going to brush the, um, the part, the side that is in, that is shadow and open up the shadows by increasing the shadows and also a little bit of exposure and add some contrast. So it's just very, very small adjustments. So if you want to see your changes on the overall image, you just click on um, Y. So here you can see the difference. And I don't like, let's see, I want to have a more colder image. So let's see what I can do here like this and uh, then I will this is what I don't like so we have as you can see I hope that you can see that we have some a tint of magenta here and that's something that I don't like I find it disturbing in this image so here in the co uh, color panel here i go down to magenta and then i simply decrease the saturation so you can see that is removed i'm not sure if there is any purple yes there is a little bit purple so i'm decreasing the purple as well so now the background is entirely black as i wanted it and i think i want to add some more contrast to the image like this and um, not very happy with the waffles. I think I will increase the orange a little bit and make it more, a little bit more red, uh, something like this. And then decrease the yellow a little bit and uh, decrease the hue as well. So I think we have something that I like here. So this is the uh, before and this is the after. So just with a small adjustments, you can achieve something that looks much better. Uh, let's see. 
so uh, that was the short editing and now I will just remove uh, go back to my other screen hang on I will just minimize this and here we are So uh, now we have reached um, the end of the webinar. I hope that you have learned something new. And before we move on to the question and answer session, I have uh, very good news from uh, <clears throat> uh, Park Cameras. Let's see if I can change the slide. Hang on, here we go. So we have, they're offering 10% off on um, X-Rite products when you use the code X-Rite 10 at checkout. And they're also offering 5% off on BenQ monitors when you use the code BenQ5 at checkout. And this offer is valid until 26th of March 2021 only on their website. So www.parkcameras.com. And this code will also be uh, sent to you by email. So let's see. Now we will be moving forward to the um, Q&A session. And let's see, we have received a lot of questions. I'm just going to drink a little bit more water. Okay, because I feel that my voice is almost disappearing. So we have received many questions and um, I'll try to answer some of them. Let's see, we have one. I think I will, I think that I will just add, uh, I'll just turn on the webcam. I'll just Turn on the light here so you can see me better. Hang on. Okay. Let's see. And now I will show you the I'll start the webcam. Share my webcam. Great, so I hope that you can see me now. We have received a lot of questions and um, I'll try to answer some of them right now. The first one is lighting. I don't have, so someone wrote, I don't have access to natural daylight and the conditions are cramped. So my advice is use artificial light. Just to tell you what I was doing before. Before, when I was doing food photography, I had um, a full-time job at the side and um, I was coming home late in the evening. So I didn't have any daylight to shoot with. So after a while, I realized that I have to invest and learn using flash in my photography. So I started with speed lights and then today I'm working with strobes and continuous lights as well. So artificial light will make you more flexible so you can work whenever you want. And um, it's true that you could work with daylight on daytime, but sometimes if it's too cloudy, then you wouldn't have enough light. So I think that it's a good thing to uh, learn flash and use artificial light if you want to uh, shoot more. And uh, let's see another question. Making it look nice and appealing without it being over the top and busy. Well, that's a very good question or topic. So how can you make food look nice? There are many, many tip, different tips. I, um, I describe what I do with, a, for example, with a whipped cream. 
photos is, for example, if you have a stew, then I would advise to um, uh, put aside some of the ingredients that you use. So, for example, carrots or herbs or whatever. And then you uh, garnish the stew after before you're taking the photo. And um, something else that I can recommend is, for example, if you're shooting pasta. By experience, I know that pasta, it gets dry very easily. So what I would suggest is to, um, before you're shooting the pasta, that you take a brush with um, some olive oil and you just brush the pasta dish with the olive oil so it will look more appetizing and fresh and not so dry. So there are many things that you can do with poo to make it look more appetizing. And uh, regarding the scene of not having a too busy scene, it's like I mentioned in the video, it's nice to use some of the ingredients in the scene, but not too much. Because when I started, I um, before I was just taking photos of the plate and the food, but it, I found it to be very empty and um, pretty lifeless. So then I realized that I, it's good to put some ingredients in the scene, but I was overdoing it. So it was crowded and messy with too many things in the scene but now I learned to have a better that it's good to have a balance so I just add a few of the ingredients near the uh, plate and in the scene so that's my tip to you uh, the next question let's see ah there is no sound I I hope let's see can you hear me okay you can hear me now I hope you didn't lose me too much. Uh, let's see. So the other question is shaping light. There are many th ways you can shape light. And um, hang on, I'll just show you what I'm using. Let's see how green this is. Come back. So you could use to shape light. You could um, use foam board boards, like uh, black foam boards and white foam boards. And these you can actually buy. I think I bought these at um, BHV in Paris, but you can find them in a hobby shop or um, or uh, a watercolor shop. They also have these. And uh, you can modify these by, for example, in the photo that I took with the waffles, you can bounce the uh, light by using, for example, a white board here. So if you have the flash here and you have a subject here, then you can bounce back the light with a bound, uh, with this uh, white foam board and then you would decrease the uh, shadows if you want to have a light and bright image. But if you want to do like I did in the picture of the waffles, then I was using a black foam board on the other side, and that's to cast more shadow on the subject. So then if you have the flash here, it's directed to uh, the black foam card, but it wouldn't bounce back any light. So this way you'll have more shadow in your scene. And another way to modify or shape light is to have um, soft boxes. I can't expand this, but this is a huge soft box, an octagonal soft box. And when I want to do uh, dark and moody photos, then I also add, I don't know if you can see it, but I use this thing. I hope you can see. This is called a honeycomb grid. And that is to um, make sure that I avoid lighting up the entire scene. So the light will be more defined and only hit the uh, subject that I have in the scene. So that's how I modify the light. Mm, and you can uh, also use reflectors, of course. And then let's see. 
Uh, we have more questions here. We have one question from Andrea. How do you find clients for your work? Very good question. Actually, it's different. I often get contacted by clients and uh, that's thanks to my uh, portfolio or website that I have online and also uh, thanks to my Instagram. So I have a lot of uh, demands and requests from my social media, but then um, to find new clients, that's, um, I have different approach to that. Sometimes if there is, usually I do a list of brands that I want to work with and um, I find them on social media or I usually buy a lot of um, food magazines like from different countries so I have let's see food magazines like this and here you can find a lot of ads and then if I find something interesting then I simply add them to my list and uh, contact them to see if we can work together so there are many different ways you can do to find clients <clears throat> let's see if we have any other questions uh, how to photograph ice cream? Well, that's a very good question because ice cream melts very fast. And um, usually I uh, use real ice cream when I'm um, shooting, but you can also uh, use uh, mashed potatoes because it has the same texture uh, visually. And I know that you can um, uh, color the, uh, the mashed potatoes in different colors and then uh, you can shoot uh, I mean forever because the the mashed potato will not melt so that's the tip and I think if you google you can find more about how you can use the mashed potatoes but that's a tip if you don't want to use um, a real ice cream and I think we are running over time so uh, I wanted to thank everybody who came and also our hosts, Park Cameras, BenQ, Tether Tools and XRite for hosting this webinar. And um, I hope that you will experiment and that you learn something from this webinar. And I'm looking forward to see your images. Thank you very much. Bye bye.